Well, it's good to be back. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and this is the chapter where David acts crazy so that the king of the Philistines won't capture him and hold him in custody for a long period of time. And because of that, our special music number today is going to be by Patsy Cline, and it's called Crazy. Crazy, crazy for feeling so lonely. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it's a crazy thing when we choose to trust ourselves rather than trust God. It's crazy when we forget about all that God has done for us and trust in ourselves rather than in our Savior. We're going to find that out. 1 Samuel chapter 21. David is fleeing from King Saul. King Saul has made it clear that he wants to kill David. Verse 1, David went to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And the Ahimelech means my father is king. He trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? Perhaps David looked disheveled, discouraged, despondent. He, did, he wasn't with the army like he usually was. He wasn't surrounded by supporters like he usually was. He's on the fly. He's on the run. And Ahimelech is concerned and wondering, what in the world is going on? Why are you here? Why are you alone? Are you a threat? Verse 2, David answered Ahimelech the priest. Now, let's picture this. He's talking to the priest. David has gone to the house of God, the tabernacle, for wisdom, for advice. Whenever you're in trouble, whenever you're going through a trial, it's good to talk to the priest. It's good to go to the house of God. That part is all right. It's what David did when he was there. That brings up some red flags. Verse 2, David answered the priest, the king sent me on a mission. Well, that's not true. You're running away from the king because he's treating you unfairly and trying to kill you without cause. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. Well, Saul didn't say that. He said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if David doesn't die, or something like that. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Well, maybe, maybe not. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Now, on the one hand, I can kind of see why David doesn't want to tell the truth because Ahimelech might feel loyal to King Saul just because he's King Saul and maybe he would hand David over to the king and I can see where David is concerned. But because David lied, this is going to come back to hurt because in 1 Samuel 22, verse 22, Saul is going to lash out at Ahimelech for not knowing where David's whereabouts are after this. And because David wasn't honest with him, Saul assumed that Ahimelech was siding with him, and he kills Ahimelech's entire family. Only Abiathar, the priest, escapes. And in 1 Samuel twenty two twenty two. 22 David says, I'm responsible for the death of your whole family. It was my lie. It was my not being forthright. I know hindsight is 2020, but it probably would have been a better idea for David to say, you know what, I got a level, level with you, Ahimelech. The king wants to kill me, and it's not fair. I'm running for my life, but I'm, I want to tell you everything so that if the king comes after me and asks you where I am, you'll know exactly what's going on. You'll be able to tell the king that whatever you want to tell the king. Tough situation. David says, give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Verse four, but the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. This is bread that was set apart after the offering of the grain offering, the fellowship offering for the priests, not only for the priests, but for the priests. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual. Whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy, how much more so today? 
You know, he's kind of rambling, isn't he? <laughs> so the priests gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. And so Ahimelech helped the future anointed king of Israel, David. And that was a good thing. It just would have been far better if David would have told the truth. Although from a human perspective, I could see why David would have been leery about anything he would have said. Not excusing him, I just understand his human this year. Verse 7, now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doug the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. Now, Doug the Edomite is a terrible man. It's hard to imagine him being detained before the Lord about anything, but perhaps all it means is that he was ceremonially unclean and he was detained there until he became clean again. Whatever the case, he's going to be responsible for cutting down and killing the priests of the Lord. David is going to feel responsible because he lied to Ahimelech by saying he was on the king's business when he was running from the king. But it was Doug the Edomite who did it. And notice that Doug is an Edomite. That is a descendant of Esau. That was a rival nation to Israel. So this is going to fuel hostility between the Edomites and the descendants of David. And David is going to take vengeance on the Edomites years later when he becomes king. And he's going to kill two-thirds of them. He's going to send garrisons to Edom. That's coming down the road in 2 Samuel chapter 8, 9, and 10. You'll, you'll see. Verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, Don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. Well, yeah, the king's mission was urgent. He was urgently trying to kill David. So David was right that the mission was urgent, but he was misleading Ahimelech for obvious reasons as to why it was urgent. Verse 9, the priest replied, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine is here, whom you killed. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. I'm a little disturbed by this because David seems to be putting more faith in the sword that killed Goliath than in his faith that triumphed over Goliath. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That's what 1 John 5 verse 4 says. So it's a little disturbing to see, number one, David lying as much as he is, and also putting as much confidence in the sword as he is. So David is hurting spiritually by what's going on in his life. Verse 10, that day David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, whoa, isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of King Achish. And what the text doesn't tell us is that apparently they took David into custody for a little while. David writes about this episode in two of the Psalms. Psalm 50. Six, when the Philistines had seized him in Gath, David is praying, Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? All day long they twist my words, they conspire, they watch my steps. And so he's crying out to God. But before he cries out to God, he acts crazy. Verse 13, he was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. <laughs> Achish said to his servants, look at the man, he's insane. 
crazy. Why bring him to me? Am I, am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? So David probably deserved an Oscar <laughs> for his crazy performance in front of the king. So they thought he was crazy. We'll just put him in custody and then we will release him. But apparently, while David was in custody, he was really crying out to the Lord. There's another psalm that David writes describing this period. Psalm 34, verse 1, it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces will never be covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved them out of all his troubles. And, and David is just pray to the Lord and speak in scripture and inspired words. But what those Psalms don't tell you is that he was acting like a nut job before that happened <laughs> to try to get a cheese to say, well, I'm not going to kill him. He's just a nut job. He's harmless. He's crazy. So that was David in 1 Samuel 21. We see the humanness of David, that even though he has a history of a relationship with God, he trusted God to overcome a nine-foot-tall giant. But he allowed himself to cower in fear before King Saul and King Achish. You know, there's, there's times like that where our faith, can be shaken when we take our eyes off of Jesus, right? Remember Peter, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, Matthew 14, he could walk on water, took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started to sink. And I think David took his eyes off of God and started to sink. So my assignment for you today is to refocus on God. You know how when you go to the eye doctor and they're testing to see how good your vision is, and you've got to look through this viewfinder, and then they focus it in so that you can see more clearly. That's what our assignment should be today, the, to spend time before the Lord and ask God to refocus our vision so that we see Jesus more clearly, love him more dearly, follow him more nearly day by day. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We'll be back tomorrow, but instead of doing 1 Samuel 22, I'm going to do a cameo exposition of the Peace Church Statement of Faith. And that'll be tomorrow at 9 a.m. And then Wednesday morning, we'll be back with 1 Samuel 22. You guys have an awesome day, and God bless.